Hi, Madeline Peru. Hi, Paula Cole. <laughs> this is so, so nice. exciting. I know. It's so nice to be close to your face and have a conversation. Mm. I mean, it's, yeah. Oh, my God. We're going to have a conversation now. And I don't mind that. It's sort of like cold calling somebody you've, uh, that you've never met and being like, so what are you wearing? No. I know. Um, but I can see what you're wearing. I can see what where you are. I can see that um, you are surrounded by instruments, and you have a, a nice looking whirly. Is that a whirly? No, that's a rose. Uh, it's a rose. Yeah, like I said, you have a nice looking. <laughs> <laughs> I have a 1972 Fender, you know, pre CBS, beautiful Rhodes. That that went out on the road with me back in the 90s, and yeah, I'm in my little studio. Well, do you want, um, I, I, would, I would like to keep it loose, but I also do have some questions that I oh, am dying to ask you. So I figure, you know, I may never get the, another chance to do this. I know. Well, we are going to share some time together on the road. I'm, thank you for that. That's, that's going to be beautiful. <laughs> I'm so excited. I can't believe I that. Know. It's wonderful. And, and, you know, being on the road right now, uh, has created all has has raised questions of its own, hasn't it? Have you mm -hmm. have you uh, have you performed recently? Yes, I've done five shows. Me too, ish. I think it might be four on my end. Yeah. Yep, and that's a whole new experience. And I feel like there's no standards out there with COVID protocols, so we have to set the standards, and we have to be the leaders and in a way that feels really good to be the ones creating the culture. And I feel like I'm very protective, like a mama bear of my, my crew and, you know, my touring family and my like a lion. Family. I know what you mean, but also the feeling that people are coming to your show and you want them to be safe. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it would be a horrible feeling to look back at a concert and say, we all came out and we had these wonderful moments. And then because of that night, somebody got sick. I mean, that just totally. really, it just, it's the weirdest thought. Totally. I don't want to send anyone to the hospital because of my show. So I feel very protective of everyone. And it's nice to see other artists doing the same. I'm, I'm online a lot watching you know, the conversations. And I feel like there's a lot of artists that are canceling shows because the promoters won't enact the protocols. And I've canceled shows because the promoters won't enact the protocols. So I, we've got to keep our people safe. That's how I feel. And I'm yeah. glad to feel the same way. And, and I get to know you better. And I'm even going to be on your bus. Like, thanks for that. That's cool. Yeah, no, you know, I mean, we can't wait to have you on the bus. We're 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 holding the the bunk is actually, I was I was actually going to try and get them to stop keeping your bunk until you get there, so that we could have more space. But that's that's a whole other thing. Oh, is it? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> your presence is already with us. We have a we have our we have a cute little bus from from New uh, to Nashville. But um, I, uh, yeah, I wanted, I, w I definitely thought it would be good for us to talk to fans and talk about, uh, about this, this question of how to be together and what our protocols are, really are. And what we want is to just take absolutely every precaution, and we have been, you know, and, uh, and uh, what, what happens is everybody is, working twice as hard to foresee every uh, interaction uh, that we have, make sure that everybody that, that in our group, and I'm sure in your group, is able to take every precaution as well. Tests available at all times, you know, backstage. And audience members encouraged to wear masks at all time, being given the opportunity to be seated separately. Uh, you know, with good social distancing in, in, in the venues. Um, every staff member at the venue has to have been vaccinated. 
and or had an, a negative test within 24 hours, I think was the last uh, word on that. Um, so there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of, uh, there's basically everything we possibly can do, right? Is that true? Okay. Yeah. yeah, same here. Proof of vaccination, masking, you know, it's a lot. And I, every time I go out on stage, I thank the audience. Thank you for being so cool and compliant and positive because this is this is our reality now. And look how much we've missed music over the pandemic. And right. it's, been, it's been disastrous for us musicians and disastrous for people in general, not to have this primal, beautiful, mystical experience that gathers us together and heals us. And right. we, we have it now, but we just have to mask up and, and follow the rules and then we can do it. So let's do it, you know? Yeah, so because because the the interesting thing is how can how can you even can we even maybe try to put into words during this conversation how how special and how essential to a certain degree it is to have community to have community and 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 to have it in the context of music where uh, it's the it's a language in which you can't argue, you can't be petty. In mm. the language of music, you can befriend somebody that you disagree with about other things, but you don't know that. You don't need to know that. I I believe that. Um, I believe that this is a an essential part of our society, and I. And, you know, I, I don't know about you, but it's everybody's at a, on a different pace. But for me, this is a long time, a year and a half now. Yeah. Um, you know, I when somebody said to me, OK, we're we're going to we're going to put shows on in September, October. I said, whenever we can, you know, anytime we can, we just do what we can. So I just want to. I. I, I want to do my best uh, uh, in terms of the, the security and the safety. And then I want to go ahead and cross the street, you know, just like you do when you're, you're afraid of something else. I want to take mm. that chance because I, 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 I don't think that you can, uh, you can stay sane without interacting with other people right now. And so if we can be part of that, if I can be part of that and, and frankly, uh, once I stop talking about that, I just want to say it's such an honor that um, that I can share the bill with you. Oh, and yeah. uh, you know because um, no, I, I really I'm just in awe of you, and I have some questions actually for you in that oh. in that subject matter. Um, yes. I, I'm I'm you know, in awe of you. I'm in awe of. Uh everything like learning more about your past i love how you're always wait a minute <laughs> you're you're always comping like you're a beautiful rhythm player and you and you know so many songs so i have like really yeah. i have like geeky thoughts really music nerd thoughts like do you just have those kinds of ears where you have a general sense like all these standards these jazz standards are part of your collective unconsciousness and that when you start playing a standard that like someone might call that your hands just kind of naturally go there or do you need to like practice like if i if i said <laughs> no we all, need to practice. <laughs> we all need to practice i need to practice all the time but but um uh the the songs themselves are are the treasure right if mm -hmm. you've if you've been around music a lot at some point in your life, that stays in your brain. There's some kind of a chemical, physical, cellular, it, it's there on a cellular level. The melody will stay with you. So if I can, uh, if, if I can uh, uh, recall, the, the purpose of the guitar for me was always to say, uh, to, to hear harmony. Um, to understand why a melody lives in a different world if it has harmony underneath it and and why some melodies sound like they have a certain harmony 
and some melodies actually don't have what you th expect them to have under there and when and how how much does that change what you thought it meant so it's it's a la it's a syntactic question syntactical question i i guess it's a, like a language thing but i'm i don't i don't consider myself a guitar player so just to say like oh my that, god that, like that, that was the thing that's so not true like you're up there with the band on every song just beautifully comping through all the chords oh they help me oh they yeah. suffer they suffer through it yeah. i mean that's like a lot like Joni. i mean she might have had her parts but Joni's really like such a rhythm player well i'm glad you brought Joni up because Joni is i think you know the epitome of great songwriting mm. and she used her guitar in in a weird way to compose those songs and I think of you as being one of the most wonderful songwriters um you know and that takes us into another area like for me it's really like you were saying about the repertoire the old repertoire that I I just I love to embody that but I really don't I really think in fact I even have something here I wrote would you like to talk about songwriting as an art form in the sense that people don't necessarily give it that mm. uh, status in mm. society the way that they might even give, I don't know, a, a classical composer status or, or, or a so, you know, uh, Yes, perhaps in the pop world, we, we, we like to celebrate people that sell records. I, I believe you know, <laughs> a lot of times it's really centered around whatever awards ceremonies or centered around people that have been commercially successful. But sort of, you know, I mean, the only thing I can think of is, okay, Bob Dylan won the- uh, Nobel Peace the Prize Nobel for literature. <laughs> for literature. That's an example of putting yes. that whole art at least into question because some people reacted and said mm -mm 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 -mm. and of course you know I've, you know i support it but also the nobel peace prize is not what it used to be <laughs> but um <laughs> well yes i do think so much about songwriting so much and i have songwriting students even because i'm a visiting scholar at berkeley college of music so i teach songwriting courses and i had to kind of create a curriculum and create something out of nothing like how am I going to talk about this something that started as a very therapeutic intuitive process that then I you know over years and years and years I, I wanted to continue challenging myself and getting out of ruts by creating new ways and angles as to how to approach songwriting you know decades go by you you don't want to just always go to the same places you you want to sometimes like I'll be like Burt Backrack and I'll try to write a melody first and then sing that melody in time with my footsteps. So I then I take it home. That's cool. I'm honing the the melody a cappella and then I take it home and then I work on the chords underneath. And that allows me more time with the chords underneath to do something more interesting. Or you know, sometimes it's journalistic and, and lyrical first. There's so many different ways to go about it, but I think you need to apply your ass to a chair. You know, that's one like basic and you need to journal. Um, my Some of my favorite writers are autobiographical like Joni and John Lennon. They really, I love, I love both. I love empathy and uh, looking at other people's stories and inhabiting that. But I really love when we can see into the artist and know about their life and, and they mm. bless their life and they bloodlet that way. Like, I love them for that, for being autobiographical. So I think like keeping a journal is, is so vital. So I have journals, you know, through my life up on the shelves and I'll go and visit my 22 year old self, you know. Oh, <laughs> what's that like? That's, oh, she was so angry, you know, but she was really angry. And I'm like, sometimes shocked. At, because there was no, there's no outlet for anger as a woman, really. Like it's so societally unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So it often turns to like self-harm or, yeah, uh, or lack of confidence, 
which then, you know, leads you to bad situations. Yeah, absolutely. So it was really, really helpful to journal and see that. It, it's so hard to be a young woman in the world, I think. You know, even though you have all this power because, you know, you're young, that you have your youth and maybe your beauty or your health, your health and your body, but. Well, women are, the female is human is a very powerful creature. You know, I have cats and I watch them leap into the air and catch things and these beautiful acrobatic athletic little creatures that can do what they do. And they're just, they're just born that way. And when you look at what a woman can do, uh, it's, I'm not, I'm not making a lot. I didn't think this about what I was saying before I started on this rant, but I really believe, I really believe what you're saying is fascinating because I mean, women, women, you know, what, what they, they do everything there, especially now. And, uh, but we haven't caught up to recognizing what you, what you said is that we have therefore all the emotion, all the complexity, all the desire. Um, And you receive all this attention that you don't necessarily want or you're just ill-equipped to handle. So, you know, I often like felt like prey and I hated it. And I just, I remember Mm -hmm. like dressing androgynously a lot or like always wearing heavy coats. And and Mm -hmm. the stage was only like, even though it's very public, it was quite personal and private for me. And it was a place for me to be I totally understand that. Why is it that the stage is such a magical place? I, I, uh, is, is it, are we stepping into a dream? I mean, I kind of feel like people tell me that I'm, I'm a different person, you know, Mm. like I just, I, I transform. And the other night I had the last time I had a concert two nights ago, I actually had a concert in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. And at the end of the last song, it was this just be- little ballad we were doing to, 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 to close the show. And apparently I, I, uh, I guess I got really focused on this very particular ballad four beats to the bar or something. And I turned and, and stared at the piano player who was playing it really intently and sang and we got a I don't remember a thing about what happened we got off stage he turned to me and he said what's the death ray for sorry what did I do wrong what did I do wrong <laughs> you were in the zone. I don't know what you're talking about I am so sorry I am so sorry I don't know what you're talking about but uh <laughs> but uh that was I guess the you downside to it, you know but but it but it is kind of like and I, he, it's funny because, you know, eye contact is a totally different thing when I'm on stage. You know what I mean? So That's so beautiful, though. Like you're in some zone. If you're in the music. Obviously, I can stand on stage next to somebody and, and, and not take the floor. But, but isn't, isn't that the thing, though, that you can... Now, that doesn't mean that you might feel comfortable. You might, maybe you might feel comfortable being naked on stage when you can't feel comfortable walking down the street clothed in a, you know, in a world where men often feel just openly, you know, comfortable harassing and maybe even worse, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not planning on doing that though. Okay. (laughs) No pressure. (laughs) God. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> wants to see that now. No, no, um, no, no not here. I think we got off. Did we get off topic? I have a problem. With get on topic. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. It's funny. And But you were um, saying, yeah, that, that, that for some reason the stage was, was a place where you could feel safe. Wasn't that what you were saying? Oh, yes. It's the stage. I, and I know it's true for both of us and so many that it's like, I can be angry, like I can express and outlet my rage, um, that 20 year old rage or, or profound sadness in a way that it doesn't hurt me. It doesn't hurt anybody. In fact, we all kind of uh, let out something and heal from it, you know, from expressing it and processing it collectively. 
and I've, you know, the songs I've written, especially the songs I wrote in my twenties, like there's some really angry and intense fiery things back there. Rockers that are like, have me screaming, ah, you know, and they're really hard to sing now, but I sing them. And, and what the feedback I get, like, is that it really helped people expressing that kind of intensity really helped people. It helped a lot of, um, LGBTQ folk kind of come out. Mm. It, it helped people get through difficult situations. It helped women leave abusive situations. It's so profound to me uh, what wow. the songs do. It, it, it's, and yes. I was just doing it to help myself, you know, to heal. It was therapy for me, but it ends up being therapy for a lot of people. And right, those- right. I mean, uh, yeah, I... But I'm so interested about your life in Paris as a busker. Like that is so different from I don't know most of what the- you did. You 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 were you were you were working. You knew that you wanted to study music and and mm-hmm. and you followed that path in from within a school and you just were already doing that right is that I was right doing that. yeah and i thought i was going to be a jazz singer i wanted to be a jazz singer and i was yeah i, I read that that's yeah. fascinating and i went to berkeley thinking like i want to vocally improvise i want to be like a female chet baker i want to be inside the chord changes and and improvise and so i was living in the real book a lot um but i i i needed to write my own truths i just had some kind of um wall singing other people's truths at that time. And, and I was going through a lot of therapy and I needed that epiphany and I needed that explosion of writing my own truths. And so it became that way. And I went down that road and that's how people know me, but. And we're all grateful that you did. Oh, well, <laughs> I still have a lot of jazz in me and I've, you know, I've made. Yeah, of course you do. Yeah. But I mean that, you know, it, it really, American music is so informed by so, so many things. And, you know, I mean, for example, like one of the reasons I wanted to study jazz songs to learn the harmony was because of the Beatles. Because I was like, how did they do that? How do they make these harmonies? Wow. And I was like, well, I bet if I learn that stuff, I can figure that out. <laughs> I still don't get that. But I never came back, you know, I never became anything. You know, I just dove into what I was doing. M- music for me, like you talk about therapy. It, it it saved my life. I mean, it just, it just, in order to be alive, I had to just say, okay, music is kind of a religion. Tell me what to do, you know, what can I do? And I've actually, I remember hearing Joni Mitchell say one time when she's writing, she would get up, she said, I'll get up in the morning and I'll go out and listen to the world and ask it what kind, what key I should play in that day. I was like, wow. okay, it sounds really, uh, you know, kooky, uh, you know, new, new agey, but, but it also sounds like really awesome and, and totally makes sense because why not? Because really, I mean, that's the thing about music, isn't it? Like I was saying earlier about it being kind of just a language that you can't argue with, you know, it's just, it just is. And I don't know what what it is about. I've read. I used to love reading all those books, music in the brain and ecstasy. I don't know if you heard about these. And then there were a bunch of books that had been coming out probably late '90s. A bunch of different like neurologists that like to play piano yeah. or you Oliver know Oliver Sacks. Oliver Sacks. Musicophilia. Yeah. 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 Right. There were a bunch yeah. of them. I was reading all of those for a while, but nobody really understands it. <laughs> Even no. Oliver Sacks didn't come out and say, here's what happens, you know. <laughs> so when did you ha- have that epiphany that it was your religion, that it was your life purpose? When, when I went that? through, I went through several periods of going, you know, I know music saved me through and got me through my teen years without dying, you know, without overdosing on alcohol without having absolutely no purpose in life. You know, it saved me many, many times, but uh, now I'm gonna have to learn to be an adult and I'm gonna have to let music go. So I went through a period in my twenties where 
-hmm. I thought this is this is probably not going to last. You know, so I should probably just let go. And I couldn't find anything else. And um, yeah, you know, I went out into the wilderness, as they say, and there was nothing there. You know what I mean? So, Were you just okay. working a job? You just working some job or something? Well, I, I, I lost my voice during the recording of my second album um, and then was in a holding pattern with my label at the same time. There were label things that happened. And I just, I, and, I, and, and they said, well, we're not going to lend you any money to do any touring if you did, don't make your next record. And so I was like, oh. I'm screwed <laughs> and uh, like didn't know that that was the situation like I had they had like I had no control over my life I realized oh okay I have no control over my life and I um I for, for a time I went I ended up going back to busking but uh, I you know I tried waitressing I was really bad at it I tried uh, delivering newspapers that didn't last too long. I, you know, I did a bunch of things. I was going to get into child, uh, uh, teaching uh, ch young children, but I was like in between qualified and underqualified and overqualified for certain things. So anyway, it's boring. It didn't it's go so anywhere. Not boring. This is so fascinating. <laughs> so you were thinking about giving up music even after you got a record deal and put out your first record. That's, that's yeah. That was exactly what I thought. I thought that that was a fluke. That first record was just a fluke. Wow. You know, and so that's what happened between the first record and the second record. And then it was like, okay. And then I was working as a waitress, driving home from the gig where I could barely cover my gas money. I thought this is, this is really stupid. Like this makes no sense. So the world, by the way, the world really sucks if you're not lucky, you know? Yeah. And, um, but there's this little uh, bar that was a sports bar, the kind of bar that I wouldn't go into dark and had like five TV screens and it for the size of the room made no sense. Too many TV screens. And, the woman that owned, had, had just bought it loved music and loved, and she wanted to hire live musicians. And I went in and uh, uh, auditioned and played a song. She said, you have a gig five nights a week. I'll pay you cash. I guarantee cash every night and food. She couldn't afford that. That place was half empty and they were, she hadn't transformed it into a live music club. It was still a sports bar. So I didn't, little did I know that, that I was kind of taking advantage of a situation, I guess, but I did that. I, I did that for, for a few months, you know? Wow. Uh, and it was kind of like a sign. It was like, okay, you can't make, you can't live without doing this. You just have to try to do it. Whatever, on whatever level you do it, that's what you're going to do in life. And that's when I gave in to the universe. Right. Was, yeah. Wow. That's so beautiful. And thank God for that lifeline. And thank God for that woman. That woman, <laughs> that woman was a wonderful lady, man. Oh, she was amazing. I've wanted to leave the music business too, Madeline. You know, it's just so hard. It's so hard. I was reading about your uh, uh, story with labels and that was one of the questions i wrote down for today's conversation because not and i said you know i don't want to make you feel angry again by bringing this up but i actually was like this that sounds in i mean that just scares me to, to think of what you went through with with the music business so anything yeah. you want to talk yeah. about i don't want yeah, to yeah no want to i know you. i don't want to upset you <laughs> i feel the same like i I don't know if I should, if it's okay to ask about the busking years in Paris. I feel the same way. Like, should I oh, ask? Oh, I'm just but... kidding. I'm just kidding. No, with okay. Me. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think I've been on five labels a, a lot and um, definitely signed bad deals and got screwed. And, um, you know, there's a lot of money I don't see. And 
um, and haven't seen for years. So, and so you won't, you won't see, is that what you're saying? I, I, I think not, but you know, I'm trying right now and I probably can't even talk about it, but, um, oh. you know, so I'm not going to give up though, you know, huh. I'm not going to give I up. I know because, you're not. Yeah. Like I've re-recorded the hits and, um, as as often as I can, I try to use the re-recorded masters so that I see the money. Right. Know? There was there's a lot of your songs from the re-recordings are are being used in in some TV shows. I think. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That just happened. Um, Dawson's Creek finally picked up using "I Don't Want to Wait" again because they used it years ago, um, yeah. and then and then they stopped using it. And there was a lot of like fan outcry, which is the, the very thing that helped me get it back. It was the voice. No of the band. Yeah, it's incre incredible. I'm so, so grateful. So grateful. But um, yeah, that came back into my life and that, that's been a blessing. And um, it's, you know, like what Taylor Swift went through. She's re recording her first album that's or her right. second album, right? You know, so that you can own the masters. And now I think mm -hmm. it's getting better for artists, hopefully, but I hear it is that generally artists are getting their masters back more easily. Mm -hmm. um, but like our generation, it was really tough. We were some of the last bastion of being mm -hmm. really, you know, pimped and hoed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the oldest profession, it, it, it's harder, it's it's very hard to quit it. And it's, and yeah, I mean, it just, it's like, it's okay if, if you want to pimp and hoe for something that you love and someone that you love, but when it's somebody that you signed a paper with, you don't know them. They don't know you. They don't care about you. That's not cool. Not cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's a sharecropper's deal. This, this totally. Oh, totally. Uh, you yeah. borrow money from me, you pay it back in tiny, tiny percentages. And then, I still own the thing that you bought. It's like, right. wow. That's exactly right. A sharecropper's deal. Amen. That's a that's the perfect way to phrase it. And this is so depressing that I don't even want to like linger on it too long. Okay, because, sorry. Like, no, I, I okay have to watch Sometimes I'm 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 grateful for it because because I have to kind of reframe it in order to cope. But also that it gives me fight and it gives me purpose. Like I'm not one of these artists who had a hit and got comfortable. You know, I'm still here, like mm -hmm. caring, and I'm gonna make a long catalog of good work. Like yeah. leave love behind and make leave a good catalog, you know? So Ooh. it gives me incentive. Okay, it, it, that's what I love. That, that was a beautiful thing. I love hearing you say that. Thank you, darling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now tell us a little bit about life in Paris, if you don't mind. Um. When you're in a foreign country, you know, of course, I'm a, I was like a kid. We got there. I was about 13 um, and wandering around and picking up a guitar, you know, and then feeling like I got to have my guitar with me when I wander around because those are those are the two things. that. The, so I just wandered around Paris with my guitar. But the other thing is uh, expat expatriates, you know, foreigners. They tend to like somehow find each other in a city, um, even in a big city. And Paris is actually not that big, you know, too. But um, and uh, and then on top of that, street musicians. They're they're they're. I guess for some reasons, musicianship in Paris, street musicianship in Paris, you know. Ha, had already been a tradition, more so than other cities, even other cities in Europe. Uh, I recently discovered that some of that comes from American jazz musicians, black American jazz musicians, being, during the First World War, actually being segregated, not being given, being, being uh, allowed to, to volunteer and join the army, but not being given weapons, not being sent into battle with white Americans, so that uh, well, there was a band. 
and they wandered around France during the First World War playing music in the street. I'm not saying that that's the beginning of, 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 uh, of uh, street musicianship, but I'm saying that there is a tradition in France of Americans playing jazz. Wow. That goes back to uh, the, was it the 127th Regiment? Uh, really, really interesting story that I know very, I know too little about to, to try to represent, but really interesting story. The guy, the band leader's name was Jim Europe, of all things. Yeah. And, wow. uh, and so they were hearing jazz in France, American jazz from Harlem, uh, big band instrumental jazz and reharmonization and re rearranging of the French uh, national anthem, for example, during the First World War. So, you know, 1917. Yeah. Wow. Really heavy. So we go over there and there's this great audience for Americans that are playing jazz in Paris. And you walk around the oh, the other aspect of Paris, of course, more than other cities, is the acoustics, you know? Walking streets, tiny streets, even if there, a car wants to get through, there's enough people that it just doesn't happen easily, so most people avoid driving down there, you know? And, um, and just the, the medieval aspect of it. I don't know why, it's not like that in a lot of other cities. Um, you know, uh, there's something about the way that Paris grew up through the, through the Middle Ages. Um, and you loved jazz already? Like, was that, did you know that jazz was your, your art well, form? The way I tell the story, uh, one way to tell the story is, um, you know, I had heard a lot of music because my father from New Orleans was playing Fats Waller records, Fats Domino records, uh, Texas Swing Hank Williams records, um, like a lot of uh, 40s, 50s era music. My mother was playing Edith Piaf records and, and um, Canadian singer-songwriter records too. But uh, pause. <laughs> I love it. You know, that's another thing. If we had time, I could ask you about why is it that some people want to make noise to show that they exist? Like, why can't why can't it be quiet but, or just acoustic? <laughs> but this, this, this phenomenon of loud engines and loud stereos is like I I really think that it's just a way of saying I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm yeah. alive. Constantly. Hey, I'm, I'm alive. I'm alive. <laughs> Okay, you're still alive, yeah. But, um, so your mom would play Edith Piaf records. So they would play these records over and over again. Wow. And when I got to France at the age of 13, I knew some Fats Waller songs lyrics by heart. And I saw American musicians playing those songs on the street. And I said, he's singing the wrong lyrics. And I went up to him after the song and I said, you know, I just want you to know you're singing it wrong. Wow. And they were like, motherfucker. <laughs> no, no, they were like, bitch. No, they didn't do that. No, no. But they were, they, they were like, oh, really? Okay, tell me. I want to know. Good you for you, you girl. Me? You got some huevos walking up to some stranger and telling him he's singing the lyrics wrong. <laughs> I got nothing else to do, right? <laughs> nothing else to do. <sighs> And, and these were American people and we're in France. So, so like I said, there's a natural ability to just walk up to people. And, and this was a while back, you know, and the Paris has changed, unfortunately. Yeah, a, the, a lot of the laws, right at the end of my time there, um, in around the time of 90, 91, I think, uh, maybe 92, was when Jacques Chirac became uh, the mayor of Paris and the president of France at the same time. Don't ask me. It's all I know. I don't know how or why that happens, but that's the thing that was happening. And all of a sudden he just said, okay, let's, let's pass all these conservative rules. And all of this stuff changed, you know, the, 
uh, little clubs couldn't have live music anymore. There were a bunch of rules that happened, and and one of them was a police would come and just take your instruments out, just taking it. Whoa. Just, yeah, confiscate things. And you know that that so that street culture suffers when the society doesn't, when the top doesn't allow it to to you know it's it's a it's a form of fascism really isn't it yes to, it is uh to try to outlaw freedoms that weren't really help hurting anybody in the first place mm. but uh so you started singing whatever with reason the band? you just started singing with the band then yes yeah eventually i joined uh uh this band um run by a, a gentleman that is just uh to this day a very singular person here i'm gonna i'm gonna oh my my cat can sit there my cat's trying to get my attention i'm taking my attention to this poster i i, I should have better pictures on the wall but this that that's the band leader and this is one of in his much this is like 20 years after we worked together so he was younger when i met him he's but when i met him he he already still had a head of white hair he already kind of looked old he just you know loved life not old he never looked old old he just had some features that were old but he um he was the band leader and he was not a musician, uh, but he, I, I could, this is a long thing. We, we don't have time for all this. Okay. But that's him, Danny Fitzgerald and the Lost Wandering Blues and Jazz Band. Did I show you that? Yeah. 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 That's beautiful. That's Thank beautiful. you. Thank you for asking. Oh my gosh. I find it fascinating. It's such a different way to go about being a musical artist. And it's, I find it really yeah. fascinating, Madeline. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's why I keep trying to get to the bottom of that because I'm lucky, but uh, I'm not sure that that you can always learn music by by on your own. But he had this ability, Danny Fitzgerald had this ability to, to believe in creating your own society. And that's a lot of work. And he managed to do it mostly because he was, I guess, so gregarious and so charming that he had friends everywhere. And we would walk down the street in in in, in every city and they'd say, hey, Danny. They'd be like, hey, man, how you doing? And then they'd leave me and say, I don't know who the hell that was, you know, but, <laughs> wow. but, uh, but it was, he created a society, you know, Wow. And uh, and I'm sure there are people today that are creating societies in the world, but see, like this is before Facebook. He had a way of creating what what we're trying to do with with social media, but in in real time, you know, in analog. Uh, and I think that that's what you and I are still part of when we play a show. We're part of creating a society in that sense, because I do believe that when I mean, the thing is, though, just those two years that I was out on the road with that street band as a teenager, we would end up meeting friends. We would, okay, first of all, you're standing on the street, you're playing a song, and you're hoping people come to you, right? Right. So there's this weird magnetic thing that you're trying to create without being pushy or demanding. There's all you can do is hope that the song that you're playing, the sound and the energy that you're putting out is going to somehow be like this. And then those people might cr help you continue that, right? And then uh -huh. you get a crowd. You get a crowd, you pass the hat, you make a moment, you make an event, you do something special. And then you take a break. Maybe it's over, but chances are a couple of the people in the audience are gonna come up to you and say, do you want to do you want to uh, come over for dinner? Do you want to play a party at my house next week, or do you want this or that? And if you're open-minded like Danny was, you say, "Yeah, man." And we slept on people's floors. We didn't know them. I was okay. nervous sometimes. I was like, "I don't know these people. We're in a foreign city. I don't speak German. I don't know what the hell is going on around here." Are they gonna do something to us? 
Yeah. Anyway, wow. I, I really feel like um, I really feel like it's so sweet to be able to have your ear. Oh, I Talk find you so brave and compelling and beautiful. And I'm so looking forward to just kind of deepening our friendship a little bit. And I can't wait to hear your amazing band and hear everyone kind of stretch and improvise too. So I, I'm, it's just such an honor. And I'm so happy to share the road with you, Madeline. Oh, Paula, I am so in awe of you <laughs> and your your musical um your you know your your work is outstanding and 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 it so happens that your your personal uh things that you talk about and that you care about i really care about too and that just mm -hmm. seals the deal for me so i'm totally in love with with you and and looking forward to it to, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, interacting. <laughs>